After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the angels and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Oh Lord, you're not far away. You're right here with us. You're not a man in the clouds. You're right here with your people. We're three or four of us gathered together. You are right in our midst. We don't have to talk to you as if you were distant. You're not distant. You're never far away from us. You're so close, Lord. We don't have to talk to you as if you were not in the room. You are in the room right now with us. Your presence is felt. Your presence is manifest, Lord. You are our Father, our Brother, our Savior, our God. And you're so close. We can be as close to you as we want to be, Lord. And we lift our hearts to you, Lord. You know us so intimately, so well. You know us better than we know ourselves even, Lord. You know everything about us. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Oh, Lord, we love you and we give thanks to you this morning, Lord. We lay it all down, Lord. There's nothing for us to carry, Lord. We can just walk and run and skip along the road, Lord. Just be happy and joyous knowing that you're here. Your presence is felt. We can feel it. We can sense it as much as we'd like to. Because you're not distant. You're right here. family, just take a moment, just sense it, how close he is. Give over to him what burdens you. Ask him whatever you want to wanna ask him. Desires are granted on earth as it is in heaven. Believe for the impossible. Believe. Dare to believe. Dare to believe. Give us the ears to hear, Lord. Family, if there's anything the Lord put on your heart you want to share, come forward. Any words, any visions, let's just minister to one another.
church, you've been chosen to come here. Their voice is so wonderful to hear. I love Dorina's accent. How beautiful she makes the words sing to me. And when someone comes up and says a word and you go, they talk to me of what God has done for them, our imagination can pick that up and we can have it. We can apply it to our own life. We can see ourselves walking in that. And that is a real privilege because we don't have to envy anybody else's gift. We just have to go out. doing a module and uh, Karis, E. Karis, it's called uh, Revelation, a progressive revelation about the Bible, opening the Bible. And uh, the Barry Bennett is the lecturer and he's, he was talking uh, and showing us how uh, he's found a scripture that had but now written in, in it. And uh, he thought, that's unusual. I'll, I'll do a Bible search on that. So he did a Bible search on that. And he came up with a whole lot of scriptures. And he read them out to us. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, he read them out. And uh, uh, what it was saying was, and this is how it was over here. But now, this is how it is with Jesus. This is what we have with Jesus. And it is so different Jesus is the total revelation and we have that in our life, how precious it is that we have Jesus we have the whole, whole revelation so everything everything is open to us we have been given everything and he read out a few scriptures but I just want to read out one that we have it is ours and this is in red so it's Jesus talking. So it says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot hear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, and that's who we have, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So... Jesus is saying that the Spirit will tell us things to come. We don't have to worry about you know, interest rates going up or not. We can go to God and find these things out. We can go to God and find out anything that's bothering us. Instead of sitting and worrying and thinking, oh, what am I going to do? We just need to go to the Spirit that is within us and He will reveal these things to us. And then it says, He will glorify me, the Spirit, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So we can know, we can actually know the inner thoughts of the Father because what Jesus, Jesus has, what the Father has, he knows what the Father has and the Spirit. Is, he says here that he will give it to us. He will tell us what is, th tell you things to come. So we have, we have everything. We have everything at, at our fingertips that we need. All we have to do is sit down and spend some time with God and inquire of him. We don't need to go looking here. We don't need to go looking there. We don't have to read this or that. It, it's all here. We don't have to read anything else. It's here. We have all the answers that we need are right here. Amen. Amen. Good word, Marita. I just saw um, like a whole lot of darkness, and then um, kind of like a, it kind of looked like a clam, but it was it was really dark, and it was like caked on darkness. But just inside there, I saw this beautiful, bright diamond 
and it was shining heaps and then you change the angle of where you look and you can't see the diamond anymore but it, it's right there and then God gave me this picture of um in Finding Nemo of how um how all the babies got taken away by this enemy that came along he took all the babies away except there was one little baby left and that was Nemo and he's the one with the gimpy fin and he compared to everybody else he didn't look functional he had something wrong with him but God was like Nemo's dad. He scooped him up and he said, come here, daddy's got you. Daddy will take care of you. And I just saw that like, we're like Nemo, you know, like with that little gimpy fin, but God sees us as that precious, precious gem to him. And he scoops up us up and says, daddy's got you. <laughs> Thank you. I have... Oh, okay. <laughs> I hand over to Francis. To do the offering, Francis. <laughs> Francis is doing the offering for us this morning. <laughs> morning, believe it or not, I was actually chasing away a crow. Very strange. A crow was trying to get in because it saw the bread. That was so unexpected. Yeah, good morning again. I'm blessed and honored to be sharing of offertory today. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll share something that I've been meditating on for a while that the Lord put in my heart, and it's purposeful giving. So I'll try to get through this, and I pray that you hear the heart and the message behind this. If we turn to First Kings chapter 10, First Kings chapter 10. This is about, this is a story of uh, the Queen of Sheba going to visit Solomon. So starting with verse 1, it says, Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with, with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So what's important here is, in verse 24 of the same chapter, it says, all the world sought after Solomon for his wisdom. So Solomon was wise and wealthy. And the queen of Sheba recognized that Solomon has something I want. The wealth, the wisdom, this is something different. And there were lots of people that visited Solomon. But there's a reason why this story is in the Bible. Because there are uh, several, several, several spiritual principles in it that we can apply to our lives. So she recognized what Solomon had. His wisdom, his wealth, and all that he had, and his prosperity. And she said, I want that. So she got up and went with a great retinue. It says a great retinue, which means she had a lot of stuff. Camels that bore spices, a lot of gold precious stones, and she came to Solomon to speak all that was in her heart. Now remember, Solomon was wealthy. He was the wealthiest man alive. Solomon did not need her spices or her gold. But Solomon had something she wanted. She had to get Solomon's attention. Like I mentioned in verse 24, there were lots of people that recognized Solomon was wise, and he was rich, and they wanted to talk to him. But she was different. She took it to the next level. And she decided to give of herself to receive of what Solomon had to give. And you will see that it says there in verse 2 that she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So by presenting herself and giving of herself, she was able to open up her heart to receive what Solomon had to offer. In Proverbs uh, that's 18.16. It says, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. So what she offered was of substance, spices, gold, and so on. But she got in return audience with Solomon, a great king. And by getting audience with a great king, she was able to speak all her heart and receive way more than what she offered, the substance. And this is a key spiritual principle. And that's why it's in the Bible. And this goes back to the law of giving and receiving. 
whatever you are giving into is what you will receive from. That's the principle. Whatever you're giving into is what you will receive from. And whether you know it, whether you admit it or not, you're giving into something. Currently, your heart is pursuing different things, whether you're aware of it or not. It might be your continual Netflix subs subscription. It could be the extra donuts you buy. It could be all of that is a proportion to what you are actually pursuing. And that's what your heart opens up, and that's what you receive from. That's the principle here that was trying to be explained. And you'll see that it goes on in, uh, in verse 3. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. You'll see a very subtle hint in here. She opened and gave up her substance, then asked everything that was upon her heart. Your, heart, your giving directs your heart. So she gave so that she was able to open up her heart to receive what Solomon had to give back unto her. And then she got an audience that she could stay with Solomon several days that she could observe the servants how they came in, the cup bearers, everything, a full experience. You could say that the queen of Sheba experienced Solomon. Why? She brought her gift, and because her gift was substantial, it opened up her heart that created the time with the king that she experienced the king. It's a spiritual principle that applies <clears throat> whether you want it or not. It's applicable in your life right now whether you're aware of it or not. So what does this mean to us? Jesus said, where your treasure is, so is your heart. Do not lay up your treasure on the earth where there is moth and all this. I'm just paraphrasing what it says in, in Matthew 6. But you lay up your treasure on heavenly things. So right now, even as we stand to give, it's just a time to stop and put purpose into your giving. Recognize that you know what? I'm opening up my heart with whatever gift I have in this moment so that I can receive of that treasure that surpasses the physical that I'm giving. So I don't know if you, uh, all of you enjoyed uh, the faith conference. <coughs> was, it, was it awesome? So if you have to stop and think, how was the faith conference funded? I'll tell you, I think Pastor Phil woke up and God had put a stash of cash before him. That's not really the case. The faith conference was funded by your giving. And of course, if you have been giving purposefully and you've been giving of it spiritually, you can reap of what was in that faith conference more than you could if you just gave leisurely. Oh, he, I, I, I don't know, I'm trying to portray something here, but I'm not sure if it's clear. So there is purpose in your giving. And if you recognize the purpose that's in this church, or in whatever ministry you support, and you fix your heart upon that purpose. And when you give the gift that you've got, expect to receive of the abundance, of the experience that is within what you're giving into. So as I'll just wind up here, I'll just say a quick prayer, but in your heart, just commit yourself to understand what is it that I'm, I really want to get Jesus says money is the least of all of these things. That's why it's a, such a great principle because everyone has money in some form or the other. Some form or the other, which means that everyone has, can tap into this principle easily because it's a law. So as we pray, think about your resources beyond now and what comes after and think of how you want to direct them to reap that spiritual harvest, the treasures that are more substantial. Father, we thank you for you are good and your mercies endure forever. We thank you that we can never outgive you. We can never, ever outgive you. We thank you for you desire treasure for us, treasure in a place that does not rot or where there is no moth. And even as we present our gifts unto you, we place our purpose on tapping into that treasure, the precious treasure 
of peace, joy, prosperity, wisdom, the gifts of the Spirit, all of those things that you have restored for us, that we will tap into it even as our hearts are directed to it. In your mighty name, amen. So you can come forth to present our tithes and offerings, and God bless you all. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That was good stuff, wasn't it? Thank you, Francis. That was awesome. Praise God. All right, where's the mums? Can we get all the mums to please stand up? Praise the Lord. Give them a round of applause. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Happy Mother's Day. To all of the mums, and I want to pray uh, and um, just release a blessing. We just want to honour you and we want to thank God for you. Um, God is so good that he provides godly mums for families, hey? And so let's pray. Lord, we just want to give you thanks and praise for the mums in our church family. We want to give you thanks and praise for the wisdom that you make available to them, the compassion your heart, Lord God, that they bear. And, uh, and, uh, and Lord, we just want to honour them this day in the name of Jesus. Lord, we, we pray that they would sense an awareness of your pleasure, an awareness, Lord God, of your compassion towards them and your wisdom towards them. And Lord, we just believe for ongoing fruit in the lives of all of our mums in Jesus' name. And all God's saints said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all, mums. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hey, um, I just wanted to say, just, just on behalf of um, uh, Pastor Verena and Pastor Phil and myself, thank you so much to everybody that was a part of the faith conference last week. Hands up, you had a good time? You got blessed? It was so good. And every, everybody that was involved, you know, whether you cooked something or whether you did other things, we just want to say we couldn't have done it without you. And uh, I know for Pastor Verena and, and, and myself on Sunday night, there was such a feeling of satisfaction. We really felt in our hearts the pleasure of the Lord, like he was saying, mission accomplished, you know. And, um, and there were some things that were really, I believe, that were imparted into everybody that wanted it and, and wanted to receive it. We, we, um, we had Fergus and Judy obviously staying with us and, and Alan and Roz, uh, we were feeding them as well right through the, those few days. So we were, we were quite busy, but uh, they couldn't stop raving about our church. They, like, um, you heard Alan talk about uh, the numerous revivals that they had been a part of. And he was, he was talking about how our church is very strategically positioned for revival. There are things that he, he and Roz saw happening in our church that they remembered seeing happening in the churches that, that, uh, that moved into revival. So they were hugely excited. Fergus and Judy were just over the moon. The number of times Fergus and Judy said to uh, Pastor Verena and I, saying, you know, man, you know, if I lived in Brisbane, I'd be coming to this church. You know, he just, he couldn't, he couldn't get over, and, and the same with Alan Ross, they couldn't get over just a wonderful sense of community that has been developed, you know, this culture where there's no cliques, you know, people, it's a cross-generational uh, connection, you know, there's people of all ages mixing and imparting to one another and receiving from one another and so thank God, I, I just, we just want to say thank you for being a part of it and um, I mean Fergus at one stage got really annoyed with me and he turned around uh, um, at our place and he said, man, he said, why couldn't you plant this church in Port Macquarie? He goes, that's where I live. He said, that's where I'd be. So, you know, it's, it's a real testimony. It's a, it's a great compliment that um, these seasoned men of God who have preached all over the world 
are coming to our church saying, this is unique. You know, in fact, Fergus said, he said he hasn't seen what's happening in our place in very many churches at all. It's something very, very unique and he's very excited about. Um, he wants Verena uh, and I to come down and spend time with him. He wants to impart more to us. Uh, it just, he just, there's a number of things. He wants, wants us to be in contact uh, with him. Uh, because he just sees that uh, there's some very, very critical things uh, that have occurred in our church that are wonderful and awesome, but it's, it's primed us for the next steps that the Lord wants to take. So I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of uh, Pastor Phil and Pastor Verena and myself. That is so, so awesome. Sam, would you please stand up? Was it your birthday last week? Oh, on Wednesday. Okay, all right. Praise the Lord. I thought it was like last Sunday. I thought, man, what? <laughs> Praise God. So you're finally double digits, is it? <laughs> I'm stirring you. 14, isn't it? Yep. I'm still taller, mate, so watch it runt. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sam. Happy birthday to you. Oh, hallelujah. We are so thankful for you, Sam. You just, you have such a radiant smile and you bring such a warmth with you and a mischievous spirit, which I've got to watch. But no, we just thank God for you, hey. And I believe you had a really blessed day too. Praise the Lord. Yep. Hallelujah. <laughs> Folks, be, be prayerful about the elections that are coming up. I'm going to share more over the next, uh, the next few weeks. It, you know, every election is important. Um, you know, for me to say this is a very important election, well, every election really is important. Um, but, uh, you know, th there's a number of things, you know, uh, and I will kind of elaborate this over time. Uh, it's, it's clear that uh, there's great sentiment right throughout our nation for good reason uh, where people have lost faith in both the major parties. Um, it's, it's for me, I've, I've said to, to Marina, I said, I feel like looking at the two major parties, I'm having to choose between the evil and the godless, you know, and it's, it's you know, like you've got one side that believes in killing the elderly, killing the babies and in, in how can you vote for that? But then you've got the other side that really have sold their souls for a vote and don't have, they don't have any sort of conscience uh, and they have, they, have, they have exhibited a total lack of leadership, particularly in the last couple of years. And, um, and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't vote, but what it means is that we need to be prayerful about how, how we vote. Uh, the, way, the way this whole pandemic has been managed, I believe people need to be held accountable for what they have done. It is criminal. It is wrong. This disease was not anywhere near as significant and it's not because they managed it well it's just that it was not a dangerous thing nowhere near and does, it, does that mean we shouldn't protect the elderly and the vulnerable no it doesn't mean that we should be protecting the elderly and the vulnerable but the vast majority of people could have got on with their lives and they have destroyed uh, not only in our nation but right across the earth they've destroyed economies and there is a bigger plan at work we haven't seen the end of this and anyway, but that's, that's a whole other thing and, and there will be, uh, at the right time, I will be talking more about that because there are things that God wants us to do. But uh, just in regard to the election, there are a few of these that are just in the foyer and uh, I would really encourage you, this is from Cherish Life and it's how you can vote for life uh, in the Senate. It tells you how you can do that and it also has a summary of the major parties and what their stand is on some of the major issues. It's really important. These, it's important that you become informed and then you go before God and you pray uh, about it. You know, you may need to do uh, some investigating in terms of your electorate and how you vote. So I'm not telling you how to vote, but I am telling you that there is information available for believers that you can have a look at. And this, was, this is something that I would really encourage you um, to, to be aware, who are the people who are running, running in politics who actually cherish life, who actually want to protect life? Uh, someone needs to speak for unborn babies because they can't speak for themselves. 
And so um, if you feel like I'm, I'm saying too much about it, you haven't heard anything yet. I will be saying a lot more, and, um, but at the right time and as, as time progresses. So I just wanted to make you just aware of that and please avail yourself of that. I will, um, uh, if we run out of this, I will get some uh, digital images to, uh, that I'll put up uh, as well so you can get a photo of it. But look, you, you can even get onto the Cherish Life website and uh and download that but uh just start praying because that's a that's a, a few weeks away and uh every vote counts our vote counts you know we can have a say you can't complain about uh what's happening in our nation if you decide you're not going to vote pastor Rudy. sorry yeah yeah and and acl have uh, obviously the uh, uh, australian christian lobby um They've, they've been raised up by the Lord uh, to keep politicians accountable, keep, keep them accountable to their word. And, um, and so they have a lot of opinions on YouTube. You can, you, can, uh, you can get on there and find out what is happening and what are the leaders and the people who are running, um, uh, what are they saying, you know, what is their stand on different things. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to take some God stories. Pastor Phil, I'm going to hand over to you. You're going to take this. Thanks, Pastor Les. Okay, what's God been doing with everyone lately? Uh, don't be shy. It's time to give glory to God. So, you know, if God's done something in your life, little or big, doesn't matter. It's something that someone needs to hear. And uh, encouragement to others. And I believe that's what we're doing, is giving glory to God. Uh, praise God, we um we get an email every time we pay our rent to say that our rent's been paid, and um we have it automatically coming out every week, except we got one two days earlier to say our rent was paid, and it was a hundred dollars more than our rent amount, and um actually a few weeks ago, um we because our rent automatically comes out. It came out and we thought it had, sorry, it didn't come out, but we thought it had come out. And then we got an email like days later saying, your rent didn't come out. We're like, that never happens. We always make sure it's covered. So that extra payment that someone paid, I have no idea how they found it, but someone's paid our rent and that covered that week that we missed out. So yeah, praise God for that. It was so awesome. Woo! God's, God's favour, eh? He, he doesn't let us go off out. He's so good. Um, you've uh, all been kept up to date with my family and how um, we're coming together and things like that. Well, the, my first daughter, uh, when I met her on the beach, she gave me a hug and she allowed me to hug her, but that's just about all. Uh, and I still don't visit her very much. She says, you know, let me know when I, if coming. Ring me before you come and that. But uh, last week uh, she had something, I can't even remember what it was now. Oh, good. <laughs> she had something that was... Uh, it was Satan was coming against her, you know. I mean, I knew exactly what it was. and um, but, but, you know, since uh, I, she came that day on the beach, she was, she was bedridden. She had um, morphine patches on her. She, she was sick as anything and she was not coping... She was sleeping most of the day. She wasn't involved with her family. You know, she was just a mother that was there that wasn't a mother. And she, she was really battling. But now she's uh, taking care of herself. She's taking care of the family. She's uh, cooking their meals at night. She's, she's got a job. She's got a job driving a van around del doing deliveries, you know. And... You know, Satan come, came at her this week because she's really come a mile, you know, and she's just doing so well and I'm so proud of her and she rang me in tears. And she allowed me to speak life into her and, you know, let her identify that it was Satan that was doing this because she was overcoming. She, and, you know, she had to start speaking. You know, tell him to go in Jesus' name. You have power and authority. She allowed me to speak those things into her life, you know. And, and, and she came through and she went off to work. And, you know, the tears all dried up and uh, she was just 
you know, it was just beautiful. It was just beautiful. And I just praise the Lord for, for his faithfulness. It's his faithfulness. It's like I said before. In, but now we have God. We have God. We have power. We have authority. We have those things now. Those poor people back before Jesus, I don't know how they got through. But we have everything. And we should be so grateful for what we have. Mm, praise God. God is so good all the time. Last week, um, during the conference, someone um, gave me some money towards my missions trip. Um, I don't know whether you're here or not, but if you are here, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Um, I'll give you a bit of... <laughs> on that day... Um, that week, the last few weeks, a lot has been going on with my rental where I live. And um, I've got a very, I don't know what's going on with the people who are managing the place, but they've given me a hard time. And I was tired that morning when I woke up and I couldn't even pray. I went to pray and then I thought, and I was like, I have no words. I just can't even pray. So I just went, God, I'm just tired. Just love me. That's all I said. And I came, I get here, and the first thing I, I meet Pastor Phil, and he gives me that gift. So you may think you just gave money, but to me it was, it was that's the first thing I thought. The prayer I made that morning, and I was like, this is just God loving me. And so you ain't answered prayer to me. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah, God is so good, eh, you know. He knows our needs and this favour because you just love God and he loves you back more than you can ever experience. Hey, yeah, look, um, yesterday I got a phone call and uh, from this lady and she's going through a struggle and all that sort of stuff. And she said, can you give me a scripture, you know, that can help me? And I said, sure. So I thought about it. And uh, it was Psalm 34, verse 7. Now, it talks about, you know, to fear the Lord, because I knew she needed to know that you don't have to be scared of God. Anyway, so I said that to her. <laughs> she went and got a Bible, and she read the whole chapter. I said, wow, she's just speaking the Word of God, and it's a powerful chapter. It is so good. I got stuff out of it I had forgotten. <laughs> It, was, it blessed me too. So, you know, um, there's people out there that need to hear it, hear the word. So don't be silent. You know, give them something. Give them something. It's like, I, I believe God's story is last weekend <laughs> at the conference. You know, the stuff that we got fed on. You know, and, it, and I know Fergus talked about, it. be bold. Get that fire stirred up. You know. The world needs it. Our people around us need it. And, uh, you know, the boldness. But he also said to focus on what you want and speak it because you're going to get it. But if you're not speaking it or you're not focused on anything that God wants, he, he wants us to reach out. <laughs> but and, and there's things in your life that you need. Well, speak it out, focus on it, and you can have it because that's who our God is. If you're loyal to him, he'll, he'll be loyal, loyal, ten times, a hundred times more than you're loyal to him. So that's great. So let's get out of our seats. Let's go and high five someone and say, you're a winner. Woohoo!
you love to. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. oh, yeah. I found all those words, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I found them all. Yeah, I went through everything. <laughs> and I found them. I thought, I'm going to write them all out. Yeah. So, I was like, hey, ben. pausing. Writing. Yeah. Pausing. Writing. Pausing. Awesome. Awesome. Um, at the end of oh, when I preach, yeah, you're going to get yes. out. And I just want you to play I'm just the, uh, You Are Good. Um, just play the music of that. You know, if you play the, the whole song, just keep playing it. And, um, Winner, mate. You gotta get the woohoo. The woohoo! Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah. Matt just ran <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. He speaks his own language. That means happy Mother's Day. It's gonna be a, a ling linguist when he grows up. He's gonna make his own languages up. Yeah. How's, Le how's Liana? How's her elbow? Oh, it's good now. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I was, we, were in, we were in the spotlight lining up and she was in, in like terrible mood and then she just locks all her weight down and then oh. I felt something click. And then she just kept complaining about her arm, so um, she went to the hospital and then they ended up putting it back in and she's been good after yeah, that. Like, she ended up like a champion though. She, had it, she ended up just having a still and then they ended up getting hungry jacks for her. She's just eating nuggets and shit with one hand. <laughs> yeah. The other arm's just like, well, as long as I keep it still, it's fine. I'll just eat my nuggets. <laughs> she was a tank. Uh, yeah. Crazy. Did you see the video of her like, dancing after no, this? No, no. Hey, it's so cute. It won't take long. Yeah. Yeah, sent me this on that night. Really cute. And, uh, that one. Was this on the way back? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, happy to you. <laughs> so cute, though. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise God. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to look at Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. Uh, let me encourage you, I, I didn't say this, but let me encourage you to uh, meditate on the things uh, that came out with the conference last week. If you received a prophetic word, they were all recorded. I know that some people have had difficulty finding them. Some of the uploads didn't get up. Micah, when will that get up? This week. Okay. Awesome. Praise the Lord. So, yeah, we, um, so we were aware that some of them, some of the uploads didn't complete. But, um, yeah, so Micah said he's going to get that done this week. So, praise the Lord. Exodus 33, verse 7. Hallelujah. 33. Verse 7, it says, Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and he called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tab tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was that whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle, that all the people rose and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. So I want you to, you know, I want you to imagine what's, what's going on. There's, they estimate that when the children of Israel left Egypt, there was around about two to three million people. And so they're out in the wilderness and they're camped and they've all got their tents. And Moses took his tent and he pitched it outside of the camp, so a distance away from everybody else, and he called it the tabernacle of meeting, that... The, the, the actual tabernacle had not been constructed yet. And so Moses has set up his tabernacle and it was a distance away. And the scripture says that whenever Moses went out to his tent, which he called the tabernacle of meeting, everybody would watch from their tent. They would watch from a distance and see what was going on. And it says, um, It came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle in verse 9, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshipped, each man in his tent door. So, 
you know, th this was obviously a, a supernatural phenomenon. There is a, a pillar that is reaching from the ground into the heavens and it's made of cloud. And this thing supernaturally, this pillar is moving. When Moses comes to his tent, this pillar moves to the tent. And it is so supernatural, it's so awe-inspiring. Everybody's watching from their tent and they just make haste. They get, get on the ground and they begin to worship God. It's just like they can see, man, this is, this is God. This is the creator of the universe and he's meeting with our leader and he's talking with our leader. And uh, in verse 11 it says, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up the people, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And the Lord said to him, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses was so hungry for the presence of the Lord. He was so hungry. I mean, he was talking with the Lord. It's, it says he, he talked with the Lord as a man speaks with his friend. And yet he was so hungry, he said, God, if your presence doesn't come with us, just forget it. We're not going anywhere. We're not, you know, like you said you're going to take us to a promised land, but if your presence doesn't come. He was so hungry. It's like the, the nearer he drew to the Lord, the more hungry he became to know him and to understand him. And I think you probably would echo a similar sentiment. You know, the more you get to know God, the more you hunger for him, don't you? The more you want to know him, the more you want to understand him, the, the, the more you sense his goodness, the more you sense like just his mercy and his compassion in your life, the more it's like, God, I just want to understand. I want to know you. I want to draw close to you. I want to, I want to feel that sense of your presence. I love that story, Audrey, that you shared. You know, just you were feeling somewhat overwhelmed and just said, God, I just need you to love me. And wow, he manifested in, in a small way, but a meaningful way, his love uh, for you. I want to talk this morning about the manifest presence of the Lord. And, and this is very, uh, I really sensed this. There were a number of things that I had on my heart that I was going to be sharing today. But it's just, it's in light of the conference that we've just had with what Fergus and Alan were ministering and the things that they had shared with you but also the things that they shared with us in private about where our church is positioned and it is very very strategic you know uh, I the Lord showed me last year that there is an awakening that's taking place in our nation in the nation of Australia now that is not the same as a revival although awakenings will produce revivals they will produce multiple revivals an awakening is just like it's just like the name suggests it's like when people wake up from a sleep, from a stupor, from a slumber, from a trance. And there's an awakening taking place. And it's taking place not just amongst the church, but it's taking place amongst the unchurched. People are waking up and they're realizing the answers aren't in our government. The answers aren't in our economy. The answers aren't in the great job that you could get or the money that you can earn or in what the doctors have to say. There's an awakening. People are realizing the answers aren't in all of these things. And I'm not trying to criticize all of these things. They, they all have their rightful place. You know, doctors are doing a job. They're committed to, to seeing people help live a healthy life. And that Praise God for that, you know. Economists are committed to understanding how money functions and to, to advise institutions and governments. Um, and so all of these things have a place. Politicians, if they're people that really want to help, 
I believe, you know, there's sincerity there with, with some of them. I think there's a lot of self-centeredness with a lot of them. But I think there's some politicians that are really there to be helping and, and, and we need to be praying for them. But there's an awakening taking place because people all over our nation are realising the answer is not in politics. It's not in the medical system. It's not in understanding economics. It's not even in understanding psychology. Oh, man, I could go off there. Man. I'll just say this real quickly because this psychology is one of the biggest waste of times that you could ever endeavour to do because it is built on a false premise that man is just a, a body and a soul. It assumes that man does not have a spirit and so it cannot answer. How can you solve a problem that has a spiritual root if you don't believe that man has a spirit? And psychology assumes there is no God, so like straight away. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll go on from that. But there is an awakening that's taking place. Awakenings usually go take place over decades and I will uh, later on God willing later on this year I want to be talking a lot more about this because there's a role that we have to play with regard to this revivals usually take place over two to five years uh, awakenings when people wake up they and they realize the answer is not in all those places then they're looking they begin to look towards heaven they look for a spiritual answer and that's how revivals take place so awakenings usually produce multiple revivals um, and that's where we are positioned and and, and I want to be talking about the manifest presence of God because I I believe and, and Fergus and Alan conferred it with us that uh, there's some really really exciting things our church is very very uh, it's positioned uh, very strategically there's things that we have done um, and uh, we've created a culture together. We've created a culture, and uh, and it's it's so exciting. Yeah, you know, part of that culture is the anointing of increase. The number of stories of people having financial breakthrough and provision. There's an anointing of increase, and God showed Verena and I that uh, ages ago, before Fergus ever prophesied that. But then, like, and then we're seeing the testimonies that come as a result of that. And if this is your home church, you can tap into that. It's, it's there. That's, that's part of the telltale uh, characteristics of our church amongst many, many other things. But um, uh, I want to I wanna focus particularly today about the manifest presence of the Lord. And, and I, I want to talk to you about some of the revivals and, and the things that we can expect uh, to take place uh, as we continue to head in this direction. You know... Uh, God's manifest presence, I've got four things I want to share with you. God's manifest presence is beautiful because it manifests his attributes. But secondly, it's powerful and it'll resize your problems. And thirdly, it's terrifying because it silences the enemy. And fourthly, it's transformational and it changes those things that you can't. And so I want to, I want to explore those four points. His presence is beautiful his presence is powerful, his presence is terrifying, and his presence is transformational. Um, so the first point is, uh, his presence is beautiful. His presence manifests his attributes. In Psalm 16, verse 11, it says, you will, show, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You know, when his presence manifests, there is fullness of joy. All of his attributes come when his presence begins to manifest. What are his attributes? His attributes are the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They are his attributes. They're the fruit of the Spirit and they begin to manifest. You will begin to sense peace, a peace of God that is beyond all human comprehension. You know, don't take for granted how wonderful peace is. You only know how wonderful peace is if you get into a situation where you're lacking it. That's a horrible place to be. 
where it's just you can't eat because you're just so restless, you're so knotted up, you can't sleep. And his presence, when his presence begins to manifest, he'll manifest his attributes. And one of those attributes is peace, a peace that is beyond all human comprehension. And it's not dependent on your circumstances being all lined up like ducks in a row. You can, you can enjoy the peace of God in the most extreme situations. How is it that Jesus was able to sleep in the back of the boat when the rest of the crew were in fear of their lives? Some of these guys were seasoned boatsmen. They were seasoned fishermen. They knew how to handle a maritime craft. And yet it was beyond their level and their scope of management, so much so that they were fearful. How is it that Jesus could sleep in the back of the boat? It's not because everything was hunky-dory, because they were taking on water. He was able to sleep because the manifest presence of God was surrounding him and there was such a peace on him that even though the boat was taking on water, he was totally at ease. He knew, my God, my Father is looking after me. He's looking after us. And you can enjoy that. The presence of God is beautiful. His manifest presence is beautiful. In His presence, this scripture says, there is fullness of joy. Joy is the strength that you need to carry on. You want the peace of God, but you also want joy. The scripture says the joy of the Lord is our strength. It gives you strength to move forward where you can laugh when everybody else is wringing their hands thinking, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What, or what am I going to do? What am I going to And instead of being tempted to that, you're laughing and you're thinking, I don't have a care in the world. And people are going, don't you, aren't you worried about this situation? And you're thinking, well, I know it looks really serious, but I just know that I'm going to get through. I just know. And his joy becomes your strength. You want the manifest presence of God in your life because it brings his attributes. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I want you to look at Exodus. Are you still there at Exodus 33? Just open there again. In Exodus 33, just after where we've read in verse 18... Moses had been saying to the Lord, Lord, you know, uh, if your presence doesn't come with us, then we don't want to journey anywhere. And, and the Lord says, my presence will go with you. And then verse 18, Moses just says, please show me your glory. You just see, I want you to kind of hear the, the, the cry of his heart. He's just, the more God, the more he talks with the Lord, the more he meets with the Lord, the more he wants to draw nearer and nearer. There's something so beautiful about his manifest presence that it just draws you. Where you experience his peace and you're not worried, even if your circumstances look imposing, even if it looks intimidating, you just know, my God loves me. He's taking me through. I don't know how it's going to work, but I just know it's going to work and I'm going to come through and there's not even going to be the smell of smoke on my clothes. And it's like you can laugh at your circumstance and situation, not because it's not serious, but just because you know the God that you serve and the God that lives in you will never abandon you. And here Moses, is he's, the more he's drawing near and feeling and experiencing the manifest presence, the more he wants. And then he says, please show me your glory. And the Lord said to him, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said to Moses, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock and it shall be that while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. God wasn't saying, some people have read this and they've saying, like God was saying, if you see my face, I'm going to kill you, Moses. He wasn't saying that. He was actually protecting Moses. He was saying, you can't see my face and live. You can't. You know, Jesse Duplantis, uh, 
many of you have, have seen his testimony about when he went to heaven. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to go and watch it. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful testimony. But he talked about how as he drew nearer to the throne, he was in heaven and he's drawing nearer to the throne. He was in his body and he would collapse. And the angel would re- give him a piece of fruit. And he said, here, eat this so you can withstand the glory of God. And so he would eat it and he would be strengthened and he would be able to stand again and he would go. And he said when he finally came into the throne room, he said there were millions upon millions of people before the throne just worshipping the Lord, crying out and glorifying him. And he said he, said he just he collapsed again and King David was with him and David said, here, eat this. And he, and he ate it and it gave him strength, but he said he couldn't lift his gaze higher than God's knees, like he saw, the, he saw God on the throne. He said he was hundreds of kilometers large. He was, he was so huge. He was so massive. And yet the presence of the Lord was so strong that Jesse and his body, even though they're feeding him this fruit, you know, like he, he's, he's eating this fruit, and yet he couldn't lift his gaze higher than God's knees. He, and, and he actually said, he said, he believes that if he tried to force it, he probably would have died. And that's, that's a similar sentiment to what's going on here. God is saying to Moses, he wasn't saying, I'm going to kill you if you try to look. He's just saying to Moses, you'll die if you see my face. And so he said, I'm going to cover you. And he said, I'm going to pass by. And you're going to experience my goodness. But then when I pass by, you'll be able to see the, the, the back parts of me. And, uh, and you'll be okay. And even, you know, like... Even then, it was a life-changing experience. Uh, we'll go on to verse, um, chapter 34, verse 1. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets uh, uh, that you broke. And so be ready in the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with you and let no man be seen throughout all the mountain Uh, Let neither flocks nor herds feed before the mountain. So he cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. And Moses rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tablets of stone. And now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. This is who God is. If you want to know what who God is and what he's like, this is what he's like. When Moses said, show me your glory, God said, you're going to, I'll pass by you and you'll see my goodness. And he said, I'll proclaim who I am. This is who he is. He is the Lord God. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is long-suffering. He is abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression, transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. generation. And so Moses made haste and he bowed his head toward the earth and he worshipped. You know, the presence, the manifest presence of God is beautiful and it makes his attributes known. Moses came to see God and he came to see God like no one else had seen up to that stage. And when God manifested his presence, he manifested his attributes and Moses saw it. And as you experience the manifest presence of the Lord, you will also begin to catch Uh, glimpses of his attributes and it's a wonderful wonderful thing I I remember uh, in in my own life uh, uh, there was this one night I went to the uh, I went to a church meeting and and uh, they were teaching that they had, had been advertising I was actually helping to plant this church and I you know I were had a home church but I would go and and help they had asked me if I would come and help and and I was helping with it and then they advertised they were going to do a series uh, on prayer and I was really interested uh, in learning more about prayer and so I thought I would go along and so they were doing some teaching on it uh, you know one of the things that we need to watch out for when we're in church is we can often kind of get lazy we can we can get like oh 
just sit there and entertain me. You know, we can get into entertainment mode and you're never going to you're never going to get everything that God wants to give you if you become like that. It's just like, well, let the band play and I'll just listen, you know. At some point you've got to engage. You know, the scripture says draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You have to you've got to draw near to him. And then he'll, there's, there's got to be a hunger on your part. Jesus didn't go running after the woman with the issue of blood. She had to come after him. Then he turned to her and he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. There's got to be a hunger on your part to press in. And, and, and sometimes we can make a mistake of being in church and just get lazy, get into entertainment mode like, uh, I don't feel like doing anything, so I'll just sit here and, and watch. Well, guess what? You're going to miss a lot of things that God wants to give you. practice what we've been learning and I was what what I'm just describing to you I was in that mode I was in entertainment mode I didn't feel like practicing it I just wanted to sit there I just kind of got comfortable and they said come on let's let's get up and we're going to just spend some time praising God and I thought oh I just want to go home watch tv you know like I've learned some stuff about prayer that's great you know and so anyway so Everybody got up and I got up and they said, we, you know, we want you to just put into practice what you've learned. Oh, I just felt, I was just thinking about going home, you know. But I'm just kind of going through the motions. Just going, yeah, hey God, thank you, you're awesome. And lots of time, you know. And yeah, thank you, Lord, you know. And, and I'm kind of like that. And, and look, part of, part of it too was I had grown up in a very legalistic church. And I had experienced condemnation for a long, long time. Because, you know, it, if, if you live under the law, if you try to earn your way into God's favour, you will not only fail in that, but you will constantly feel a sense of condemnation because the law strengthens sin, the Scripture says. It does, you know, you can't, get, you can't get into the presence of God through your efforts You've got to recognize, God, I need you. And, and then let him lead you. And um, so that was part of what I was battling too. Is I, you know, I'd, condemnation was just something that I that was constantly, I constantly felt condemned before God. Felt like, man, I just see all of these wrongs that I've done. So to praise him and say, you know, hey God, thank you that you love me and things, I was kind of feeling like, oh, I don't think you really do because I've done this wrong and I've broken my word here and I'm so selfish, self-centered in this area. And so it was just constantly condemned. So that was part of it too. But, but part of it, you know, I don't want to gloss over it, was I was just lazy. So I'm just kind of like, yeah, thank you, God. You love me, you know, and praise you and thank you for forgiving me. But uh, there was no real faith there and I wasn't really, my whole heart wasn't in it. And I remember just something deep within me, and I believe it was the Holy Spirit, stirred in me. And he said, come on, why don't, you, why don't you say it like you mean it? You're just mouthing phrases. Why don't you just, why don't you, you actually think about what you're saying and say it like you mean it? And that was hard for me. You know, getting even beyond the whole feeling of laziness, it was hard for me because I felt like, God, how could God love me? How, you know, when I think about all the wrong things I've done, how could God possibly think that I'm good or think that I'm nice? How could he want to hang out with me? And yet the spirit within me was saying, why don't you really praise him? And so I, really, I kind of stopped and I thought about it and I thought, well, I know the word says that he loves me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So I know that the word of God says that he loves me. So I can get in agreement with that. And so I just began to say, God, you do love me, you know, and I'm sorry that I've just kind of been mouthing phrases, but I just, I want to honour you that uh, even though at times I don't feel like you love me, I know the truth is you do. And so I want to praise you and I want to give you honour and thanks. And so I began to stir myself up and really acknowledge what he said in his word about it. And, you know, uh, as I did that, and I don't know how long I did that, probably just a minute or two, all of a sudden I felt the manifest presence of God start coming down upon me. It was like a thick 
warm honey and it came down. It came down my hands. It came upon my head. It came upon me. As it went through my mind, it's just like all of a sudden, it's like my eyes were opened. It's like I'd, I'd had like these blindfolds on. And it's like my eyes were suddenly open and I saw how much he loved me. And I just began to yell out. I said, my God, you do love me. And I was now shouting and I was yelling and I was crying and I was sobbing and there's snot coming out. And it's just like, I'm just like that. I'm going, God, you love me. You're just so amazing. And I don't know how long that went for, maybe five minutes, maybe ten minutes. I honestly don't know. But I just remember that at at some point, like his manifest presence was so tangible and so strong on me, I was just taken up with him. And then I heard the pastor say, okay, we're going to wrap this up. And I was horrified. I was, I was horrified. I thought everybody was feeling what I was feeling. I had not looked at anybody else. I was just lost. It was just like me and Jesus. And, and, and so when, when I heard the pastor say, we're, we're going to wrap, wrap this up in a minute, I opened my eyes, hoping to catch the gaze of some others around me, like, dude, do you agree with me? We shouldn't stop. You know, like, you know, and like, they were all kind of like going, mm, okay, you know, and they're all, I'm going, no, don't, don't sit down. Like, I, I didn't say that, but I was thinking that, please, you know, like, and, um, but it was so strong. It was so powerful. I remember I was pleading with the Lord. I said, God, please don't go away. Please don't go away. I said, I have to sit down because they want, I said, please, you know. And so I sat down and I just, his presence was so strong. And I remember, um, uh, you know, the, the pastor was just making some closing comments to finish the service. And I'm thinking, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I want to get out of this building. And um, he finished and I just zipped straight into the car. I sat in the car, put my seatbelt on. I said, Lord, I said, are you here? And again, his presence just came on me. I don't know how I drove home that evening because I'm not exaggerating. The tears were just running so profusely down as I'm driving home. You know, it's just like, it's a miracle that I could see. And it was just, it was so wonderful. I remember I came home, I just went straight into my bedroom. I didn't want to watch TV, I didn't want to eat, I didn't want to do, talk to anybody. I just wanted to be in that manifest presence of the Lord and just worship Him. The presence of the Lord is beautiful and it manifests His attributes. I, you know, I, I worked back then as a bus driver. I had to get up at 4.30 in the morning, it was past midnight and I knew I had to get some sleep and I begged him. I said, Lord, please, please don't go away. I said, I've got to go to sleep now. I said, but please don't go away. You know? And I woke up the next morning. And I remember as soon as I woke up, I thought about him. I said, are you here? And again, his presence. And that happened for a number of months where it's just like I, every, any, just about any meal break that I had while I was driving buses, I would just want to go away somewhere. There was a, a ministry that was nearby, just near the, the bus depot. And I, I, I went in and I, I asked them if they had a spare room that I could use where I could just worship and spend time with the Lord. Uh, and they would le- lend me this, this room that I could use. But I went, I went there so frequently, they actually set aside a room for me. I didn't know anybody in that, in that ministry, but it's just like I just wanted to... The point that I'm trying to make is that his manifest presence is beautiful. And you become aware of his attributes and it's intoxicating. You don't just want a head knowledge that he's good. You want to experience his goodness. You don't want just head knowledge that he brings peace. You want to experience the Prince of Peace in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My second point is the presence of God is powerful and it'll resize your problems. Have a look at Psalm 97. Psalm 97. And verse 5. Give me an oil when you're there. Psalm 97 verse 5. It says, the mountains, the mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. 
I wonder what the mountains are in your life. What are the obstacles? Is it a relationship problem? Is it a financial issue? A housing issue? Is it a, an employment issue? Is it a health issue? This scripture says the mountains melt like wax. You ever seen what, what happens to wax when you put a flame to wax? It just melts. This thing, you can have some, like a solid candle and you can put a flame or some heat to that candle and suddenly that solid candle becomes liquid. And the mountains in your life and in my life, the scripture says, they melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. You know, his manifest presence is powerful and it'll resize your problems. That mountain suddenly, it melts. And it's like, wow, that's not that big after all. But it melts at his presence. When you become aware of his presence and you develop that awareness of his presence and you begin to enjoy, you know, God wants you to enjoy an awareness of his presence. He wants you to enjoy. He wants to meet with you and manifest himself to you. He doesn't want you just fixated on an experience, okay? You want to, you want, you want to be bigger than that, but you will have experiences, and he wants, he wants you to have experiences with him. He wants to visit with you when you read the Word. He wants to visit with you when you worship. He wants to visit with you when things aren't going well, if you just give him room. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when you become aware of his manifest presence, all of a sudden you're not intimidated by what the doctors have diagnosed. You know, the, the, there's, there's testimonies that I've heard of people that get a, a, a terrible diagnosis from a doctor and they will laugh. And they're not laughing at the doctor, they're actually laughing at the diagnosis and the seriousness that the doctor is trying to put on it, and they're laughing because they're just so aware of God. You know, when you become so aware of His manifest presence, suddenly the mountain just looks tiny. It just melts away. And they laugh at it. I remember hearing this one testimony of someone who was given a terrible diagnosis, and they looked at the doctor and they said, that's a lie. <laughs> and the doctor said, what? And they said, you run those tests again and you tell me if that's what it says. And so they ran the tests again and this person was totally normal. There was no, and yet the first set of tests were life-threatening illnesses that this person had. What happened? Were the, tests, the first tests wrong? No, it's just the person was so aware of God's manifest presence and how powerful that is that it resized the problem. And they said, this is no problem at all. Run the test again. Hallelujah. I rem you know, uh, I remember uh, I went with uh, uh, my friend Wes. Uh, he invited me to come with him to Papua New Guinea. And uh, we did some ministry there. And we saw some great miracles. We went to some very remote r regions. It's, it was wonderful, but it's rugged. It's tough. I mean... You, you go to a place, there is no electricity, there's no running water, you know, there's no toilets. It's like, oh, man. they built like, they're, they're just used to going in the bush, right? That's, that's how they do their business. But they heard that these two dim-dims, they call white people dim-dims, right? And I said, why do you call us dim-dims? And they said, well, you know, like the colour of your skin, you know, it's... It's a dim dim. And I said, well, my colour is almost the same as your colour. And they said, oh, well, you're just dim. <laughs> they said, we went to this village and, and they knew the dim dims are coming. So, and and th this was so remote and it was so hard to get to. It took four days of travel. We went, we went as far as an aeroplane. There was no other airports. That's where we landed. Then we got in a four-wheel drive. We crossed three rivers until we ran out of road. Then they put us in a boat. And we went as far up the river as we could till the boat couldn't, and then we had to walk by foot. So it took us four days to get in, into this place. And they built us a toilet because the dim-dims are coming. The, the, the problem is the average height of a PNG person is like here, right? So they built it slightly higher than that. So I'm trying to stand and go to the toilet like this. That's real hard. 
And then there's one night I'm going to the toilet and there's this tarantula on the, on the wall right there. I'm going, come on, go. <laughs> oh, that was hard. Anyway, we saw some amazing miracles, you know, some great, just manifestations of the power of God. And with every successive meeting, we grew in a confidence because we just became aware of his presence, that his manifest presence. The point that I'm trying to make is the presence of God is powerful and it'll resize your problems. And we became more and more aware and we began to move with greater confidence, greater confidence, just calling out all sorts of, just getting words of knowledge and calling them out and praying over. And, you know, I remember we did this for 17 days we did it. And towards the end, we went to this island, a very a beautiful island called Samurai Island. And um, we, we held a series of meetings and there was real revival that was starting up on this island. And I remember this one night we called for people that needed healing. And this one guy came out and I said to him, I said, what, what can I do for you? And he just looked at me and he went, I'm thinking, what? I said, well, I said, you came out for prayer. I said, what do you want? And he went, I'm thinking, I don't know, was there a language problem? So I called the associate pastor. I said, look, can you talk to this guy? I said, I, I have no idea. I said, I'm trying to ask him what he wants. And I don't think he knows what he wants. And anyway, the associate pastor said, oh, he said, I can explain. He said, he's deaf. I said, so when he's shrugging his shoulders because he doesn't know what you're trying to say. And I said, oh. I said, well, I said, just ask him, does he want to remain deaf? So he signaled him and, and he went, no. And so we laid hands on him and, and, and within moments his hearing returned to him totally normal and people, it just erupted in a, just an echo of praise right through the building. The point that I want to make is just I remember when they told me his problem, I wasn't intimidated like, oh, man, I wish it was just like a headache or something, but, you know. It was just like... The, when you become aware of his presence, his presence is powerful and suddenly the problems are resized. They're tiny. And it was just like when they said he's deaf, I just said, well, ask him, does he want to stay deaf? And he got healed. He got totally healed and set free that night. You want his manifest presence in your life because it resizes the problems in your life. Do I hear an amen? amen. Hallelujah. My third point, the presence of God is terrifying. And it silences the enemy. In Psalm 9, you don't need to turn there, I'll read it out. It says, in Psalm 9, uh, verse 2 and 3, it says, I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. The enemies, it silences the enemy. His presence, you know, we can't put God in a box. He's huge. He's massive. And there are things we can understand about him. But there's also things that are mysterious, awe-inspiring, and will cause you to bow. D did you notice how when Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the top of the mountain, and he was displayed in his splendor, and Moses and Elijah were there and he spoke with them. And Peter got really excited and said, man, let's just have like a, a camp out. Oh, we'll build a few tents. Jesus, you can have the center tent. And suddenly the presence of the Lord God himself came. And he said, this is my son. You listen to him. Right? And Peter, James and John, they didn't look at each other and say, should we kneel? They were on their faces. They were... They were sucking dirt. Do you notice that? Did you notice in that in that thing, God didn't just come and say, "Hey guys, can you listen to him?" There's a part of God that is awe-inspiring, that is terrifying almost. Jesus reached to them and he said, "Listen, don't be afraid. Get up." But there was something. There is, you know, the fear of God isn't where you've got to be scared of him. But there is an aspect of God where you, you recognize, yes, he's your father, but he's also God. Hallelujah. In Psalm 76, verse 7, it says, You yourself are to be feared 
And who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? I want you to look at something in Acts chapter 13. Turn to Acts chapter 13. Hallelujah. Are you getting something out of this this morning? This is so exciting. I believe this is what the Lord wants, wanted me to minister. I wasn't planning on ministering this, but I believe it's a, it's a preparation. And this is some. This is really, you know, you would have noticed last week, Alan and Fergus. There was a big difference in their ministry. Alan is a teacher, and so he teaches. He goes and and he'll teach point by point by point, which is wonderful. Fergus is a prophet, and if you're trying to get point by point by point from Fergus, you'll miss it, because it's the heart, it's the spirit. It's, if, if you listen to him, you'll pick his heart up. There was something. And he, he really focused a lot on the presence of the Lord. So Acts chapter 13, verse 4. Give me an oivy there. It says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they, this is talking about uh, Barnabas and, and Saul, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. That's John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. It says, Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So, you know, here's this guy, Sergius Paulus, who's the proconsul. He's, he's uh, appointed by the Roman Empire to oversee the things on this island, the business of this island. And he heard about what was going on. He would heard about the miracles that were taking place through Saul and Barnabas. So he called for them because he wanted to hear what they had to say. He was really interested. But there was this, uh, what does it say, a, a sorcerer in verse 6, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, and then in verse 8, it renames him as Alimus. But Alimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood Saul and Barnabas, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at Alimus and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord. Everybody say the hand of the Lord. Paul is saying the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind. This wasn't the hand of the devil. This was the hand of the Lord. There's something about his manifest presence that is terrifying and will silence the enemy. Paul says, The hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. When God begins to manifest his presence, it is beautiful and it'll, you'll begin to see his attributes, but there's also an aspect of the manifest presence of God that's powerful. It'll resize your problems. And the third point that I'm trying to make is not only is it powerful, but it is terrifying and it'll silence the enemies. I remember there was a huge revival that took place in Argentina, swept through. And there was in this one particular town a high priestess, a satanic high priestess. She was the high priestess of uh, San, San Muente, I believe. I could be pronouncing that wrong, but it, it, the, the English translation was, I think it was Santa Muente. And the English translation from the Spanish is Saint Death. She was the high priest of Saint Death. 
And this revival was taking place and thousands upon thousands were being swept into the kingdom and there were all sorts of manifestations of miracles and healings that were taking place. And this high priestess would, would loudly condemn it and mock it and make fun of it and try to bring down curses upon the people and upon the churches. And in the midst of this revival, suddenly this high priestess went silent. And stopped saying anything. And no one saw her. So after several days, some of her followers went to find her. And they went to her apartment. And when they walked into her apartment, they found on her bed, she had been burnt to death. It was just ashes. But nothing else burnt. Not her mattress. Not her blankets. Just Her body had been burnt and turned into ashes. And next to her on the table was an idol of Santos Muente, Saint Death. And that was ashes as well. And news of that spread through through the town. And great fear came upon that town. And even more people came to Christ. There is something about, you know, we, we, we need to understand that while God loves us, And he wants to manifest his goodness to us. And he wants to resize the problems in your life. There is an aspect of God where we need to have a reverential fear and awe and respect. Hallelujah. And this is, you know, there's there's good reason why we do this. Because this becomes more and more clear when revival begins to um, to grow in a place. It's kind of like we know the, the kingdom of God is represented by light. And we can get together and it's like light is all around. But when revival comes, it's like that light becomes more and more focused and now it's like a laser. And it's like that becomes dangerous if it's not used properly. Or if, you know. Now, you don't need to be scared of God. God doesn't want you. He hasn't given you a spirit of fear. But we also, at the same time, need to have an awe and a reverence for him. Hallelujah. And the the, the fourth point that I want to make is the presence of God is transformational. It changes what you can't change. In Mark chapter 3, verse 14, it says, talking about Jesus, it says, Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and have to... And to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. And then when they were with him, they began to understand how the kingdom worked. And they received authority and power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. The presence of God will transform you when you're with him. When you're with him. Now we know that God will never, if you're a believer, God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. But you know, you can, you can live your whole life unchanged even though Jesus lives in you. At some point, you want to see him manifest his presence in your life where you begin to experience who he really is, where you begin to see how powerful he is and your problems become tiny in comparison, where you have an, an awe and a reverential respect for him and it begins to transform you. There's people, and I'm sure you would know it as well, there's people that go to church all their life and yet they're not changed. Why? Because they've never entered into the, the, the manifest presence of God which transforms. Jesus chose 12 and he chose them primarily that they would be with him because he knew if they were in his presence, their lives would be transformed. And then he gave them authority and power. To go and do the work. His presence will do that. I remember, you know, one of my favorite um, uh, uh, evangelists uh, through the ages is a man by the name of Charles Grandison Finney. Great man of God. He, he actually spearheaded uh, what is known as the Second Great Awakening. And there were multiple revivals that took place. I will talk more about awakenings, uh, God willing, later in the year because I I think it's, it's really important that we understand it. But um, Finney went into this one area of Delaware, which is in the northeastern uh, part of the United States, very, 
very remote region back then anyway. It was very remote. And um, uh, he, was, he was in Philadelphia and he was holding a, a series of meetings. And it was a great revival that was taking place. And up in the Delaware Hills in the mountains, there was a community of lumberjacks that stayed there almost permanently. They would live there. They had their families there uh, that they would raise. So women and children were there and the men would work through the winter cutting down trees and then they would raft these trees together. I mean, you didn't have trucks back then. So they would raft them together and sail them when the snow would melt, sail them down the river and take them into Philadelphia and sell the wood and get money and then go back up into the hills. And in this region, there were thousands of lumberjacks and their families that were living, but it was a very, very hostile environment. There were no schools there. Many of these people didn't know how to read. There were no churches there. It was very, very rugged and very remote and very, very hostile. Anyway, Finney was in Philadelphia and he's holding this series of meetings and several lumberjacks came to his meeting. And they were so overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord and Finney's ministry, they gave their lives to Christ. And they went back up into the hills. And two years later, Finney came back to Philadelphia and he's holding again another series of meetings. Again, another revival breaks out. And several of these lumberjacks had come down. And they came and they saw Finney and they said, do you remember us? And Finney said, I don't. And they said, we were here two years ago when you came and ministered. And they said, you, you impacted us and you changed our lives. And he said, well, that's wonderful. And they said, well, we're, we're here to ask, would you send a minister, would you send a pastor up that we, could, that we, you know, we need some help? And he said, why is that? And they said, well, there's a revival that's broken out over the last two years. Over 5,000 lumberjacks had come to Christ in the space of two years just through a small handful of men who experienced his manifested presence and it so transformed their lives they couldn't stop talking about it. And there were were just manifestations of God's presence. They were telling stories in the midst of this where lumberjacks were getting up in the middle of the night And they would become aware of his presence without anybody talking. And they needed to go find someone who knew something about God to tell them about the ways of the Lord. And by the time Finney had come back, two years had passed. And now there was over 5,000 that had come to Christ. And Finney said it was one of the most remarkable moves of God that he'd ever been, uh, you know, that had ever come to know. That there was no pastor, there was no minister. It had just been a handful of people that had been seeking the Lord. And now they were saying, we need some help. We don't know how to manage this. Hallelujah. That's what his presence will do. It'll transform lives. There was another, there was another village that Finney had gone into. This was in the state of New York. Uh, it was in a, in a village called, they called it Rome. And... Um, uh, a, a revival had broken out there and there was a, there was a, a sheriff that lived in a neighbouring town and his, his responsibilities were both in his hometown, which was Utica, as well as Rome. They were only a few miles apart. And so he would, he would frequent, frequently go to Rome and just check on how everything was going and then come back to Utica. And they were hearing this n- news of this revival and, and astonishing manifestations of what the Lord was doing. Uh, in Rome just began to spread everywhere and this sheriff was with a bunch of uh, with a bunch of friends in a pub and they were making fun about some of the reports that they were hearing about how people were crying out to God at all hours of the night and and things like that and anyway uh, time came for him to actually go to Rome that was part of his duties and he was pretty curious he was kind of glad that it was time because he wanted to go and see other reports like what what he'd been told and so he's, he's on, he, he was in, in the winter and he's, he's on a sleigh and the, the horse is pulling him and he's not really thinking about anything in particular but he, he, grow, he goes across this bridge where there's a little canal and that canal on the, on the map is the border of the province of the, the Shire of Rome. And he didn't really pay much attention except that when he crossed the canal all of a sudden he just became aware of this sense of awe. And he just like, 
was like all of a sudden there was a solemnness that was there just in the air. And he's thinking, what is this? And as he's going closer and closer to the town, this sense of awe and solemnness is becoming heavier and heavier. And he's thinking, what's going on? And he comes into the town and everywhere he looks, he can see the people are experiencing what he's experiencing. He brought his horse up to the hotel where he was staying and the boy came out to tie his horse and he looked at the boy to have a conversation and the boy looked at him with this seriousness and he could see the boy felt it as well. And so they, they didn't want to talk. So he got, he got off his sleigh and he, he went in and he gra- grabbed himself a strong drink and he sat down with some, some prominent men of, of the town who he needed to meet with and they began to conduct their business. And several times he was just be so overwhelmed with this presence of God, he felt like he, had to, he was going to burst into tears and he would push himself away from the table and go stand at the window so no one could see that he was struggling to keep himself composed. And he's trying, he's trying to breathe, he's trying to change what he's thinking, thinking about some other stuff so he doesn't think about what's going on. He doesn't know what's going on. He left that town in a hurry. He, he ended up coming to Christ several weeks later. But he left that town in a hurry and he never, ever made fun of the move of God again. He realized, you know, like some people were trying to make fun when he went back to Utica and he said, listen, say what you want, but something's going on there. Something real is going on there. It is not a figment of their imagination. And in, in a number of weeks later, the revival had spread into Utica. And he had come to Christ. You know, the presence of God will transform lives. His life was transformed because he became aware of God's presence. Hallelujah. I hope that I've stirred in you a desire to have more of him. Now, we understand that All of Jesus already lives in you if you're a believer. But he can live with you all of your life and your life will never change unless you actually be intentional about letting his life transform you. And I hope I've stirred something up in you. Because the next steps that we need to go as a church, we need to be a people who are not just satisfied with the status quo. We need to be a people who are not just satisfied with having just a nice service, that we open ourselves out. You know, Fergus and Alan were thrilled to see how many people come out and share prophetic words, and that's wonderful, and that's awesome. But let's not stop there. Let's see what God wants to do. Let's open ourselves up. But realize that we've got to put our agendas aside then and let God be God. Do I hear an amen? Let's stand up. Hallelujah. I got this picture um, when we were worshipping and I just saw us standing under a waterfall and being sprinkled with the water of life. And then the waterfall became very heavy. It was like Niagara Falls and we were standing there and it didn't hurt us. We were just like standing under the water but... The veil of the water was so dense that we couldn't see it beyond it. And we're just immersed in this water of life and, yeah, just absolutely sodden, just filled with the water of life. But I was, I didn't really understand what that, like not being able to see through it meant. And I felt like at the end, as you were preaching, God brought that picture back into my mind. And I thought, we can't see what we are to become but we can look look forward like as though we're looking through that big veil of water and ask the Holy Spirit to show us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, um, Ben's going to play some music and I, I really want to, I want to open it up right now and uh, I want to invite you to come and make a response uh, by stepping out and I don't want you to do this. You don't, don't, please don't do it to impress anybody here uh, or do it because others are doing it. I want you to think about your relationship with God. I want you to think about where God wants to take you. And if this morning there's been a stirring in your heart that God is saying, there's so much more I have for you, because that's what I believe is the heart of the message. 
that he's saying, there is so much more that I have for you. Will you stop limiting me? And if that's what's resonating in your heart, then I want you to respond by coming out and just begin to talk to the Lord while you're out the front. You can worship. You can worship in tongues. You can sing a song. I'm not going to lead in anything. This is just your time with the Lord. Pastor Verena and I, we're going to move as the Holy Spirit leads us and we're going to lay hands on some people. But it's not for us. I don't want you to be looking for us to be laying hands. I want, if this has been stirring you this morning and you're realizing, God, I want more of that. I need more of that. I don't want just a mundane life. I want your manifest presence. I want to know how big you are. I want to walk in that reverential awe and respect. I want it to be so real to me that your attributes become so predominant in my thinking. I want it to be so real that all my problems are resized and I see the mountains melting like wax. I want it to transform me. If that's the echo of your heart, I want to encourage you to come out the front and begin to do business with God. Begin to talk to Him. Begin to worship Him. Sing a song to Him and just begin to talk to Him about whatever He's been stirring you up about. So that's what I want want to do. Just you come out if uh, if you're in those sort of situations and and you want to um, you want to deal with that, Hallelujah. you to be timid when you when you're out here at the front you begin to share your heart with the lord hallelujah you begin to utter your expression to the lord what